I always want to call your attention to this to just remind you. I thank Jesus for our financial partners. We have monthly financial partners. We have people who send gifts at different times. Um, we appreciate all of those things. We can only keep doing this as we do it, as the Lord lays it on your heart to give. Now, you can give on our website, hopeandpassion.org, or you can mail to our mailing address. But I want to tell you something. We are one of those ministries that is sticking to the word of God. We're not about hype. We're not about fluff. We're not about seeker friendly. We want people to have the truth. And so therefore, we are depending on God to speak to those of you who are dedicated to the truth to give to this purpose. So hopeandpassion.org or our physical mailing address, please pray and ask the Lord if he would have you to support this ministry with a one-time gift, a monthly partnership, whatever he puts on your heart. And I thank him for speaking to you this morning. All right, we're going to get to today's message in the Revelation live stream series. And to do so, I'd like you to turn in your Bibles, if you have them, to Revelation chapter 5. Revelation chapter 5. Now, we are picking it up this morning at verse 6, and I will do a little bit of review here at some point. But let's look at Revelation chapter 5, beginning at verse 6. I'm going to read, and then we're going to pray, and we're going to dig into God's amazing and holy word. Here it is. Between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders... I saw a lamb, with a capital L, standing as though it had been slain with seven horns and with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song saying, worthy are you to take the scroll and to open the seals for you were slain and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on earth. Hallelujah. God's word is powerful. I'm here to tell you that these are the very words of God. This is not fairy tale. This is truth. And we are going to dig into what the Lord Jesus has to say this morning. I'm going to ask you wherever you are, whatever you're doing, if you can't bow your head, if you can't bow your knee, at least bow your heart. And we're going to call on you we're going to call on the Lord to help us this morning. He's the only one that can. Lord God, we come before you in the name of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. We come and we thank you for the Holy Spirit whom Jesus has sent, who is present with us in this broadcast. Lord Jesus, I'm asking you to cleanse my heart and my mind to help me to think clearly your thoughts. Pour out the anointing oil of your Holy Spirit all over each and every one of us. Steer us away from every distraction that the enemy would try to pull us away with. Help us to focus in this morning on the very real truth of your return on the reality that each and every soul is accountable to you, that you are moving history in the direction that you want it to go, and that sin will be judged. But those who come under the blood of the Lamb, hallelujah, we will reign victorious in Jesus. Let that hope fall all over us this morning. God, empower your people and save those who need saved from their sin. We thank you for this time together. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, the first thing that I want to do is just 
talk about for a minute Revelation chapter 5 verses 1 to 5 which is what we covered last week as we talked about Jesus uh, getting ready to reclaim the earth we left off last week with the Apostle John if you remember weeping I mean he was wailing and weeping this was an inside pain and the the great Apostle John one of the sons of thunder who's exiled on the Isle of Patmos, receiving the revelation, the vision from God, he finds himself weeping because he gets a vision of, he gets a glimpse of that scroll sealed with seven seals, which as we talked about last week, is the title deed to the universe. And by the way, if you've missed previous sessions and you want to catch up, go to Shelley Prindle on YouTube and find those sessions. But I'm going to tell you that last week we left John crying because he saw that title deed to the earth. And he, he's, he's waiting for the redemption of God to come about, the full redemption of God. He's waiting for the Messiah to return and remake the universe. And as God begins to give him a glimpse of the throne in heaven and he sees the title deed to the earth held in the right hand of God who's sitting on the throne, he weeps because no one in heaven, on earth, or below the earth, not man, not angel, not demon, no one, no saint of God, no sinner, no one is found to be worthy to open the scroll and begin to unfold the end time events. And I want to tell you something, as horrific as the end time events are going to be, if we don't have the righteous judgment of God in this world, we can never have the right universe that he's bringing. So John begins to weep. Until, until one of the elders tells John, one of the saints in heaven tells John to weep no more. Because the lion, hallelujah, the lion of the tribe of Judah, Jesus Christ, he has conquered and he is worthy to take the scroll and to unveil the end time events. And that is in fact, who does this? And that's where we pick it up in Revelation chapter five, verse six. We, we see John has been weeping. We see that he's been told that the lion, Jesus Christ, the lion has the right to take the scroll and begin unveiling end time events but then right on the precipice of this John looks can you imagine being John and seeing this happen John looks to that same throne he looks to where the action is you know he's he's seen a glimpse of all of heaven and the throne and then he's focused in on that title deed to the earth in the right hand of God the Father and now he watches something happen at that point of reference and he says between the throne and the four living creatures, and last week we talked about them, they were strange creatures. They had eyes all around and within, and they had six wings. And the elders represent the saints of God in heaven who've been raptured up, all right? And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, John said, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain with seven horns and with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Now, how curious, because John's been told to quit crying because the lion has conquered and can open the scroll. But when John looks, it's not a lion that he sees. My friends, what does he see? Say it with me, a lamb. How many of you out there know that the lion is the lamb and the lamb is the lion? Oh, we're going to get to that. It's so exciting. And I want you to notice that this lamb is among the elders. The lamb is in the mix of everything that is happening and with the saints of God. And he's standing there and he is a lamb standing. Now let's look at that first. Because in the Greek, what you might not realize is not only is the word not sheep and it is lamb, but it is a diminutive term. The word there means a very little lamb. Just look at that picture for a minute. Let that sink in. A very small, new lamb. Frail and fragile and dependent. I want to tell you what. 
The first time that Jesus came to this earth, my friends, he came as a lamb. Hallelujah. He withheld his glory. He is God Almighty, but he chose to withhold his glory and to walk fully dependent on the power of God's Holy Spirit. He chose to come as a servant, as someone to serve us, to pay for our salvation. And so most of the world did not see him as God. Matter of fact, they crucified him saying he was a blasphemer to equate himself with God. Because who could believe that a lamb, a sacrificial lamb, who could believe that a Messiah would die on a cross? And yet the lamb is the lion, my friends. Praise God, the lamb is the lion. Who is thankful for that? The world has only ever seen him as a lamb, but the world is soon to see him as the lion of the tribe of Judah who is going to take over the universe. And I want to tell you something. If you hear nothing else that I say, you want to be on the side of the lamb today because you will see him as the lion soon. And you have got to be on his side when he takes over the universe. Our God is so amazing. His first coming and his second coming. We see, we see two different truths about him in those comings. We see his love and his sacrifice when Jesus came as the lamb and withheld his glory. He, he didn't have to die on the cross. He's God of the universe. But he did. When he comes the second time, my friends, we're going to see his power. He let his enemies crucify him here. And by the way, we have all been enemies of God. Christ died for us when we were alienated from him. But when he comes back the second time, he is going to put his enemies down. They will be judged. They will be destroyed for eternity, eternal destruction. And he will reign with those who love him. Hallelujah. I love what J. Vernon McGee said regarding the lion and the lamb. The Lord Jesus Christ is a lion and a lamb. The lion character refers to his second coming. The lamb character refers to his first coming. That's why people get so confused about Jesus because they choose only to look at the nice Jesus, the the, the sacrificial Jesus, and they refuse to read the entire Bible to look at the whole counsel of God and to see that that same Jesus is the coming king. This is why we must read and proclaim the whole Bible. I just love how during this time of pandemic, God has saw to it that Hope and Passion Ministries would go online and begin to reach people all over the country and in other countries and that we would declare Genesis and Revelation simultaneously. Praise God for that. We need to know all of the truth about Jesus Christ. The lion is symbolic of his majesty. The lamb is symbolic of his meekness. As a lion, he is sovereign. As a lamb, he is savior. As a lion, he is a judge. As a lamb, he is judged. The lion represents the government of God. The lamb represents the grace of God. I want you to think about that for a minute. We are currently living under, now God is sovereign over all authority, but God is allowing the powers of darkness to have their heyday to fulfill his plan. We are, per, we are living right now under the government of men, but we're experiencing the grace of God to come to salvation. Soon we will be living in the millennial reign of Jesus. Soon we will be living under the government of God. Can't wait for that day. But when that day comes, the day of God's grace will be over. And he will be reigning. You only have now, my friends. You only have now to call upon his name. Soon the church will be raptured. Soon the lamb will take the scroll from the right hand of God. And the, the events of the tribulation will begin. And there will be no warning. You have today to experience the grace of Jesus Christ. And you don't know when that day is over. 
Now, I want you to look closely at this next phrase. It is a lamb standing as though it had been slain. Now, I don't want us to go over that too quickly. Because actually, if you look at the root word in the Greek behind slain, so John's not just seeing a lamb here. He's not seeing a cute little lamb as I, as I showed on the screen just a minute ago. He's actually seeing a lamb, and in his own words, he says it's a lamb standing as though it had been slain. So there's something about this lamb that shows John this is a lamb that had, had some violence done to him. Actually, in the Greek, the word there for slain is svatso. And it's a wild word. The word means to slay, to slaughter, or to butcher. It's a word that means to put to death by violence. So when John looks at the throne of God and sees this lamb here, he sees a lamb that looks as if it had been slaughtered. This is a very difficult thing for John to see as it was in reality when Jesus was crucified on the cross. But imagine that in the future, when Jesus takes the title deed to the earth to unleash the tribulation events, he appears still as a lamb looking as it had been slaughtered or butchered. What a savior we have. What a price he has paid. Because so many will rail against God and say, how can you believe in a God who's going to enact the horrific judgments of the tribulation period? And I would come back to them and say, the most horrific judgment of God that ever happened was not judgments upon sinful people who are rebellious against him, who have ruined creation. The most horrific judgment of God that ever occurred was the judgment that God himself put on his own son. When holy, sinless, loving God died on a cross and was slaughtered. Not for his own sake, but for our sake. That, my friends, is the worst judgment. The craziest judgment that has ever happened. Not the tribulation. Because the tribulation is launched by the lamb. The lamb who was slain. The lamb who died to spare you from the tribulation period. No man, no woman has an excuse. He was slain to spare you from the judgment that you deserve. This is the, how many of you out there know this is the gospel? Amen? This is the the gospel. We're getting down to the heart of it here. This lamb looked as though it had been slaughtered. I don't know what the image is there that John saw. And you know, uh, I, I find it interesting that God reveals himself to us through a written book. He doesn't reveal himself to us through a picture book. And, and some, I hesitate. I, I hesitate to display pictures of, of things that, that are happening in the Bible. I hesitate um, to see form actually put to it, because I believe there's a reason that God revealed himself through words and not pictures. I think sometimes when we put something to a picture, there's no room left for our own imaginations and the spirit of God to show us what it may be, and we kind of limit God. So what did John see? I can't picture exactly what he saw, but I know that it was a lamb looking as if it had been slaughtered. And that had to have profound effect on him. And it should have profound effect on us. I want you to notice something else about a lamb looking as it had been slain. I put down in my notes the reason that you and I will have no scars in heaven. Is because of the price that Jesus Christ paid for our salvation and eternal joy. Our scars will be gone, but he forever bears his marks as a witness to the greatest sacrifice of all. We owe everything to him. Did you ever think about that? Did you ever think about the fact?
fact that you bear no scars, uh, no physical scars, no, no, no scars of all of the trials that you faced. We'll bear no relational scars. We'll bear no spiritual scars of our sins. The glory of God will so eclipse all of what we've been through that our scars will be erased. We won't carry those burdens anymore. And the reason that we'll have no scars in heaven is because Jesus will forever, forever bear his. His scars will forever testify that the price has been paid once and for all. You don't have to pay the price. You can't pay the price. He paid the price. Amen? Heaven. It's going to be so amazing. And I pray that every single person who is watching this live or who will watch the recording will get down on your knees and say, Lord, I want heaven. I want Jesus. Oh, my friends, that's what I'm praying for. Now in verse 6, we look and we see that it was a lamb that John saw. And the, the concept of Jesus being a lamb is all throughout the scripture. I mean, it begins, if you will, we don't, it wasn't necessarily a lamb, but back in Genesis chapter 3, after Adam and Eve sinned, and they tried to cover their shame with leaves, the clothes of their own making, and God had to come with his own hand and slay an animal and cover them with animal skins as a foreshadowing, as a picture of the blood that have, would have to be shed to cover sin. And as we work our way through the Bible, we go to Isaiah 53, which if you haven't read that chapter for a while, please read it. Isaiah 53 is a wonderful scripture uh, prophesying the suffering of Jesus. And in verses 6 and 7, the Bible says, all we like sheep have gone astray. Every single one of us is like a dumb sheep that just went astray, walked away from our protection and the righteousness that God gave us, and we sinned against him. We've turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. I, I look at that and I say, we've turned everyone to his own way. We've scattered to our own selfish thing. When the Bible says, narrow is the way, Right? We should all have been going God's way, but instead we scattered and did our own thing. But the Lord laid on Jesus. The Lord laid on his son the sin, the iniquity of all of us. And so Jesus was oppressed. He was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb, see it there in Isaiah. You know, we're reading it in Revelation, but look at Isaiah. Like a lamb that is led to the, what does it say? Slaughter. Isn't that a neat cross-reference in your Bible? Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. He allowed himself to go through this. He didn't call on the angels to save him. Rather, he gave himself as a sacrifice for my sin, for your sin. What a theme in the scriptures. And then you jump to the New Testament before the book of Revelation and we have John the Baptist. He looks over the hillside and he says, it, it, the Bible says he saw Jesus coming toward him. And the words that came out of John the Baptist's mouth were, Behold the what? The Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So before you want to get angry at the Lamb who's going to release the four horsemen of the apocalypse, you need to realize that this same Lamb offered to take away your sin. Amen? Amen? Oh, I love how the Bible traces themes throughout. And I pray, you know, so many of you say, I take notes, Shelly. I re-listen to the message. I rewrite the notes. Listen, you are doing something that matters so much. As you allow the word to wash over you and to get into your heart. And I'm grateful that you're seeing the big picture of the word of God. That Revelation doesn't stand as some weird book isolated from the rest of the Bible. How many of you know that's true now? Amen? It's all tied together. It all makes sense. Now this lamb had seven horns. Horns are a symbol of power. Seven is God's number of completion or perfection. So Jesus had perfect 
power, complete power. Seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. We've encountered that twice before in the book of Revelation, that number of perfection. This is an allusion to the Holy Spirit. Jesus here is still filled with God's Holy Spirit. How many of you know that's how he walked on earth? He served the Lord by being filled with God's Holy Spirit. When he left, he sent the Holy Spirit to dwell in each one of us. And as he stands at the throne of God, he has the Holy Spirit and he has all power. That's our Savior there. Verse 7 is such a pivotal verse in the book of Revelation. You might want to highlight it. You might want to circle it. I'm going to tell you what. The Bible says that lamb, Jesus, he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. I don't know what exactly that exchange will look like. But that lamb takes the scroll from the right hand of his father. As the father gives to him. John chapter 5. Read John chapter 5 this week. John chapter 5 tells us the father has given all judgment to the son. Because the son paid the price. So the father willingly hands the title deed to the universe to the son. For him to enact the judgment. I want to pause for a second and say thank you to those of you who look into, further into the things that God prompts me to tell you to read. Like when I say, read John chapter 5 this week, read Isaiah 53. Or last week I said, if you've not listened closely to Chris Tomlin's uh, song, Is He Worthy? Do so, because it matches the book of Revelation. And so many of you, I saw you sharing it on your Facebook page, saying that you were listening to it. God will bless you in those efforts to know him more deeply. So the lamb takes the scroll. And this is a point of motion and movement and action now in the book of Revelation. It's going to change everything. Because from this point on, we're going to see the tribulation happen. Saints are already raptured in heaven with Jesus. And now he's going to get to business of judgment. Because remember, that scroll, as we learned last week, is the title deed to the earth. It is the last will and testament of God Almighty, the owner of the universe, and Jesus has it. And he's going to open each of these seven seals. We're going to see the seven seal judgments. We're going to see the seven trumpet judgments. And finally, we're going to see the seven bowl or vile judgments, the most severe of all at the end of the tribulation. As we study this book, John Philip said, suppose the question had been asked of Jesus, what is the basis of your claim to the title deed of the earth? Jesus's reply could have been threefold. Oh, I love this. Jesus, if he was asked, how do you have the right to take the title deed to the earth? He could have answered three ways, according to John Phillips. I love this. He could have said, that world is mine by right of creation, for I made it. I shared that with you. John chapter 1, Hebrews chapter 1, Colossians chapter 1. Jesus is the active agent in the creation of the universe. So why does he get the title deed to the earth? He could have said, that world is mine by right of creation, for I made it. It's mine by right of Calvary. For I redeemed it and bought it with my blood at the cross of Calvary. And thirdly, he could have said it's mine by right of conquest. For since the only language the unregenerate heart of man understands is the language of power, I'm going back to claim that world in war. Those are sobering words. But if you read Revelation 19, Battle of Armageddon, Revelation 19. The Bible says that Jesus will judge and make war. Listen, the unregenerate, the heart that's not remade by Jesus Christ, it doesn't listen to grace. God's offering his grace and look how many people rebel against him and turn away and continue in sin. So for everyone who will not respond to his grace, he's got to come back in power. We don't apologize for that. This is the word of God. God is sovereign. He is king. This is God's world. Can I get an amen out there? And if you don't respond to his grace, you will respond to his power. 
I cannot say it any more clearly. My heart cannot be, be more burdened to make you understand this. Call on him now because he will come in power and it will be too late. Verse 8, and when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb. Of course they did. These living creatures are angelic beings and these elders are the saints of God who've been raptured, a representative of all the saints of God through history. And they fall down in worship. It's all they can do. And each was holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. Notice that they all fall down in worship. And I put in my notes here, Jesus is worshiped just as the Father is. Back in Revelation 4.10, we saw all of heaven worship the Father. And now we see all of heaven worship the, that's right, the Son and the Holy Spirit. All three. 100% God. Jesus is God and always has been. The world, however, has not recognized him as such. But soon, after the judgment of the tribulation, every knee will bow to him and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. Philippians 2, 10 and 11. Can I get an amen out there? Right? People won't respond to the lamb today, but they will respond to the lion one day. And people who don't see Jesus as God and just see him as some prophet or some nice man or some delusional person, people who don't see him as God, they will see him as God one day. And as you can see in Revelation, he is worshipped here just as the Father is worshipped. And then the Bible says that these elders fell down. They were each holding a harp, which is a symbol of praise. And golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. In the Bible, incense is always a picture of prayers rising to God. Don't skip over this. Just as the Lamb takes the scroll to take over the world, the Bible says the elders are holding these bowls full of incense. These prayers of all the Christians throughout all of history. This is absolutely incredible. Listen to what Charles Swindoll said. Even if God doesn't answer your pleas for help now, one day when Christ reverses the curse and rights all wrongs, your desperate cries for his intervention will finally, hallelujah, be counted. God never tosses your prayers into a trash bin. He's storing them up in bowls. And he will one day answer them in ways beyond your imagination. So be patient. Some of you need to underline this in your Bible. And you need to be reminded that there's coming a future day. And that day will be when Jesus takes the title deed to the earth to fix everything. And on the day when he comes to fix everything and begins the judgment of the universe, that will be the day that you will realize that every prayer for healing that you made will be answered for those who know him. That every prayer for salvation will come to fruition. That every prayer that we might have true peace and joy and unadulterated love and relationship with him will have come true. That will be the day that every prayer you've prayed for addictions to be broken, for heartache to be over, will come true. Amen? Hey, God sometimes heals here on earth. And every good gift he gives us here on earth, it's just a picture of what is ultimately to come. But our prayers get definitively answered on that day when Jesus begins to take over the world and make everything right. He's holding our prayers in bowls. Reminds me of Psalm 56 verse 8 where the Bible says he also keeps count of our tossings. He keeps count of our uneasiness. He puts our tears in a bottle. He writes about them in his book. God has not forgotten you. He's not forgotten us as Christians. I know the world is topsy-turvy. I know you have many pains and heartaches and they run deep and you cry over them at night and you labor with them during the day. But I'm here to tell you, God has them all. Praise him.
Who is thankful out there? God has them all. And this is why we read and study the book of Revelation. And this is why extra blessing is promised to those who understand it. You have to live in actual hope, not pie-in-the-sky dreams. This is reality spelled out for us. Hallelujah. I'm getting just a little bit excited this morning. Is anybody out there excited with me? I don't have a technical department to tell me whether the hearts are coming in right now or not, but I'm believing, I'm believing by faith they are, and I'll check it out later on the recording. Verses 9 and 10. So the living creatures and the elders at the sight of Jesus taking the scroll, they fall down in front of him, and they sing a new song, a new song saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation, and you've made them to be a kingdom and priest to our God. And they shall reign on earth. How beautiful is this? A new song. I want to tell you that the Bible is clear that we Christians should be singing a new song often. In Psalm 96, 1, Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Psalm 98, 1, Oh, sing to the Lord a new song, for he's done marvelous things. And if I could sing, I'd bust out into one right now. <laughs> That's one of the prayers I'll be thankful is answered. In heaven, you know, I'm, I'm so grateful to God for giving me the gift of communication by word, by speech, but certainly not by music. <laughs> but we are to sing in our hearts to the song, uh, to the Lord, a new song at all times. And what that means is you should be so growing in your relationship with him that you are learning new things about him every day. Every day, there's a new dimension to Jesus Christ for you. We'll always have something to learn. Hallelujah. Some new blessing, some new way that he's working in your life, whether it's through pain, doesn't matter. It's still a reason to rejoice because you're getting closer to the Lord. And I like how Matthew Henry speaks about singing new songs, as, as we were told to do in those scriptures. He said, sing a new song. That means an excellent song. The product of new affections clothed with new expressions. We speak of nothing more despicable than an old song. But the newness of a song recommends it. For there we expect something surprising. A new song is a song for new favors. For those compassions which are new every morning. Hallelujah. Lamentations chapter 3. Lamentations 3, 22 through 24. God's compassions are new every morning. We should wake up every day with a new song in our heart. But I'm going to tell you something. No song that we can sing now will ever compare to the new song that we will sing in heaven. Hallelujah. You talk about a song, that will be a new, new song. That's just not God working through in our lives here on this broken world in our broken hearts. But this will be a song when everything, everything is made right. What a song we'll sing that day as we realize who Jesus truly is. And we see him as the lion. Praise God. They sing a song. They're overwhelmed by Jesus' worthiness. They see now it's all coming together who he truly is. You are worthy to take the scroll and open its seals because you were slain. Remember, he's the lamb looking as, it as though it had been slaughtered. And watch this. And by your blood you ransomed people for God. Maybe you need to underline that in your Bible, this phrase here. By your blood you ransomed people for God. I want to pause. I want to get, I want to slow this down for just a second. When the lion shows himself to be, when the lamb shows himself to be the lion, when Jesus finally takes rightful ownership of this earth, judges it, condemns all sin and sinners, and makes everything right, the song that we will sing in heaven will be a song about the blood of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. 
because then we will know more than ever that there was only one thing that got us there. There was only one thing that could pay for the price of the universe to be fixed completely, and that is the blood. So I got a question for you. If the saints in heaven are singing about the blood of Jesus Christ, if the angels and the living creatures are hearing the song of the blood of Jesus Christ, why is not the church today singing the songs of the blood of Jesus Christ? Do a little research on your own. I want you to think about this. We're hard pressed. I'm, I'm, I'm just this is a little bit convicting, but let's talk about it. Worship songs today, uh, many of the worship songs that people sing and, and they think those are the most meaningful songs in their lives are, are sung to God like he's some kind of romantic boyfriend. You know? You don't even know if the song is about God or, or a person. We're hard pressed to hear a song really talk about the cross, but even talking about the cross, people can envision the cross as a nice symbol of sacrifice, of love, and they don't really get the the horrendous nature of what was done at the cross. When the blood of Jesus Christ literally poured out from his body as he was wounded for our transgressions. We don't hear about the blood as much anymore. We don't sing about the blood. It's too gory, right? People with seeker-friendly churches, they don't want to turn people off by singing about some bloody mess. I got to tell you something, that bloody mess is my Savior dying for my sins. That I don't have to go to an eternal hell and live forever under the weight of my guilt. That is the precious blood of Jesus that flowed down his body, that flowed down that cross. Do we sing about it? Do we talk about it? Because they are in heaven. The saints of God in heaven ascribe their salvation completely to Jesus and his blood. This is the very essence of being a Christian. The one thing that John saw was the lamb who looked like it had been slain and they're singing about the blood. Why then do we hear so little about having been redeemed by the blood of Jesus in our churches? And I put in quotes because some I don't even think should qualify as churches in our churches today. I don't know what you're thinking right now. I can't tell if you're giving hearts. If it's, it should be a little silent as we ponder this. There are denominations that have changed hymns to remove the wrath of God, to remove the blood of Jesus Christ. You should do it. Do a test. To, uh, you know, tune in to the worship of, of a number of different churches and see how many songs mention the actual blood of Jesus. Boy, throughout my growing up in church and still to this day, oh, I love to sing. There's power in the blood. Power in the blood. These are some old hymns singing about the, the blood of Jesus Christ. If you want to look them up, if you want to play them this week, if you want to ponder them, this is a beautiful one. There is a fountain filled with blood from Emmanuel's veins. Wow. And sinners plunged beneath that flood. Lose all their guilty stains. It's a beautiful song of praise. How many of you remember, are you washed in the blood? The soul cleansing blood of the lamb. Or that simple but beautiful song, oh, the blood of Jesus. It washes white as snow. I want to tell you something. There are many times my spiritual antenna go up. If I'm sitting talking to someone who claims to be a Christian, and they talk often about God, but never mention the name of Jesus, my antenna go up. Because Jesus is the only way to God. Another thing that makes my antenna go up is when somebody talks about salvation or forgiveness, but they never reference the blood of Jesus Christ. My friend, 
You very well may be saved, but have not realized that the core root of your salvation is in the most powerful substance on the face of the earth, which is the blood of holy God, Jesus Christ. Talk of it, because that's what they're talking about in heaven. Sing of it, because that's what they're singing about in heaven. And thank God for it. And maybe when you begin to realize how precious is the blood of Jesus and how it was shed for you and what a gory scene that was, maybe then you'll be, you'll be able to realize, oh, I guess my sins can be forgiven because this grace was not cheap. It was paid for in the most grave of ways. Hallelujah. I think sometimes our guilt is not relieved because we don't realize what was done. Part of the falling away, part of the apostasy of the end times that Jesus said would happen, the apostle Paul said there'd be a great falling away before the Antichrist is revealed. Part of that falling away and that false teaching will be to neglect, of course, true salvation and the blood of Jesus Christ. Make it your mission to concentrate on the precious blood of Jesus. And then the Bible goes on to say that those, when they were singing this song about the blood, they were reminded that when Jesus died on the cross, and I gotta tell you something here, God is not racist. Man, we, we had a big session on that when we were studying the book of Genesis about God made all races, and not only did he make all races, he died for all races. Can I get an amen out there? Jesus died. Look at this. He ransomed. He paid for people, for God, from every tribe, from every language, from every people, from every nation. doesn't matter what country you're from. It doesn't matter what your skin looks like. It doesn't matter what language you speak. It doesn't matter what people you come from, who you've hung around, where you've been, what you've done. Amen? The only thing that matters is, have you called upon Jesus Christ? God saves people from all places, from all backgrounds, all races, all languages. I really do wish I could sing. I, I, I would love to burst out into song right now because the word of God is so powerful. And the truth is so right there in front of us. And you've made them a kingdom and priest to our God and they shall reign on the earth. We'll get more to that. But just know, we will reign on this earth. Verse 11, then I looked, John said, and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders, the voice of many angels, numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands. Myriads there means countless, innumerable. So John could not even begin to count the number of angels. Sometimes we say, how many angels are there? How can angels be functioning all the time to protect us and to help us? Well, there's countless number of angels. John said, I saw them. They were so many, I could never even begin to put a large number on it. So here he, I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders, the voice of these angels, and they were saying with a loud voice. So the angels were saying it too. Not just the saints, but the angels. Not just the living creatures, but the angels. Worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And there it is again. Worthy is the what? The lamb who was slain. It's one of the, the songs that, that was played right before I came on today. Worthy is the lamb who was slain. And I heard every creature. This, this gets me. For those of you who love your pets, you love animals, listen to this. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them. So look, this is every creature in heaven on earth and even the creatures in the sea, even the dolphins, even the sharks, even the crabs. Some of you are crabby, all right? Doesn't matter what the creature is. Every creature said to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb, 
be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. Every creature. This is incredible. All angels, all humans, all animals. Everything in the way that God has designed them, bringing praise and glory to him. I can't wait for that day. What a day of rejoicing that will be. When all creatures rejoice. And again, what do they say? Highlight it in your Bible. They say to him who sits on the throne, God the Father, and to the Lamb. The Lamb that looked as if it had been slaughtered. An eternal reminder that he has the right to do what he's doing with the judgments that are about to happen. And the four living creatures said, Amen! And the elders, the saints of God, fell down and worshipped. I got to tell you, just like we should be singing about the blood of Jesus Christ, there should be times when we open up that Bible and we are so overwhelmed and overcome by who Jesus is that we just fall to the chair, fall on our knees. And we're overwhelmed by who he is. Hallelujah. Wow. What a time in the word this morning. Do you agree? What a time in the word. I want to pray for you. And don't tune out when it's time to pray. That's important time, right? I'm going to pray over you. Because a lot has been said here this morning. But I do want to remind you as we pray, please, if you've been touched by this word, if you want us to keep being able to put this out, partner with us. Partner with us. Because the money that you're giving, you might as well consider is just being thrown over to eternity. It is eternal treasure waiting for you. When you see the faces of people who have been saved and who have been drawn closer to Jesus and because of that others have been saved, you will see eternal treasure in heaven. Because as you can tell, we are operating by the power of God's Holy Spirit to preach the word without compromise. Lord, I want to thank you this morning. It has been a powerful time in your book. God, I pray this week that you wrestle with people's hearts. I just want to pause right now, Lord, and pray. If there's anybody watching who's never understood that it is the blood, it is the lamb who had been slaughtered on the cross, it is the blood, his blood that saves us. If there's someone out there watching who thinks I couldn't be forgiven, my sin is too much, it's too bad, I'm too rebellious. Listen, my friend, the blood of Jesus can set you free. Hallelujah. Lord, grab hold of hearts that need to know your blood sets men free. Lord, may we meditate this week upon the truth of the lamb who was slain. May we worship you, rejoice in you, hope in you, and be strong in you until your soon return. I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Listen, please don't forget Tuesday night, Genesis Bible study at 630. And on top of that, I don't want you to forget that next Sunday morning at 10 a.m., we will begin... Revelation chapter 6, the first horseman of the apocalypse. I pray you'll be with us. God bless you.